When you hear the words Internet of Things, what comes to mind? Increased connectivity? Sure. Innovation in consumer electronics? Absolutely. Industrial innovations? Definitely. But what does all of this have in common? A whole lot of data. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. At the heart of our growing IoT ecosystems are high-performance semiconductors. But integrated circuits alone cannot make a successful IoT system. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Peter Blaze from Kemet and Ryan Wetzelman from Pulse join me to discuss how passive components are crucial to the development of successful IoT frameworks. We take a closer look at the RF, wired, and power distribution aspects of IoT system development and investigate how the Yagio Group is advancing innovation in the world of IoT with a wide selection of passive components. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from the Yagio Group. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Amelia. Great to talk to you again. Excellent. And hi, Ryan. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about enabling the flow of data in the world of IoT. But before we get started, what's new in the realm of IoT these days? Well, that is a great question, Amelia. And there are lots of things that are new with IoT, but I'd like to go a little bit into the history of IoT and see what's changed because it really does go back a long ways. Actually, back to the turn of not this century, but the previous century, early 1900s. You know, when you think of IoT, it really comprises two key elements, and that is one, transmission of data, and then two, wireless. And so when we look at both of those components, we go back to the Marconi wireless station that was set up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts back in 1903. And that really is the origin, in my mind, of IoT. There were wireless transmissions occurring between North America and England, or the United Kingdom, as it was referred to back then. So much has changed. So let's delve into what has changed since the early 1900s. First, let's look at transmission speed. Back in 1903, when Marconi was doing his wireless transmissions from Cape Cod to England, the data was traveling basically at the speed of light across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, if we look at data transmission today, data is also traveling at the speed of light. That's interesting because back in 1903, there wasn't huge amounts of data being transmitted. Matter of fact, if we take a look at the amount of data transmitted back in 1903, it came out to about 24 words per minute. And that's assuming somebody was pretty quick on the finger hitting that teletype bobbin to transfer the Morse code. These days, if we take a look at amount of data transferred, we're well above gigabits per second. It's actually about 25 gigabits per second. That's if you look at it, it's roughly, I don't know, in the order of 60 million times more data, or actually 60 billion times more data transferred today versus 1903. What is the reason behind this? It's very simple. It is due to the amount of data traveling in parallel. Data back then traveled at the speed of light, but it was one dot or dash that was traveling, and then there would be actually a big pause between the next one. And on the receiving side, you could only listen to with the human ear information so fast and write it down on a piece of paper. These days, you've got massive amounts of data that are really traveling at the same speed, but right immediately after one another in terms of packets being transferred. And all of that is really the result of, frankly, massive amounts of processing power done in our semiconductors. Okay. So Peter and Ryan, what about the real world today? What are we looking at in terms of data transmission? 
Well, if we take a look at data transmission or the world of IoT today, it's all around us. You know, most people think of IoT related to their smartphone or their smart speaker or their smart fridge where they can have the fridge go and order another gallon of milk when they're running low. But it encompasses a massive amount of other elements to make the entire system work. You know, it comprises of, first and foremost, you've got to have a data highway that's the backbone of it, which is really fiber optic cables that are, you know, span within cities and between cities and across oceans. And so those, think of those as the highway of moving data around. Then you've got all of that data is going to destinations, which then it's getting dispersed, whether it's base stations for cell towers or, you know, Wi-Fi access points in buildings or data going into data centers for storage and manipulation or data going to your vehicles to keep track of where your vehicle is driving or, you know, giving you driving assistance information. So we also need to expand this and talk about RF systems as well, right? Absolutely. And so if we take a look at the world of IoT, it really comprises of a few different building blocks. And, you know, I'd like to use my example. I actually have to travel next week and I was probably have to make some adjustments to my automatic watering system in my house. So while I'm out of town, I'm going to go and access my cell phone and I'm going to pull up my watering app for my yard. You know, I can go and reprogram the settings, you know, from the convenience of my cell phone. And if we talk about RF, a lot of the pieces of this IoT picture really are associated with RF. Obviously, my cell phone is an RF device. It's communicating wirelessly between the cell phone and the cell phone tower which uh, may be in close proximity or some distance away from my physical location. And on the other end of the whole scenario or the whole system at my home, there's a wireless router, which is you know, acting as a uh, Wi-Fi hub. And that is creating a network, a wireless network immediately around my home, which wireless devices inside of my home can communicate with which happens to be the controller for my watering system. So RF, I like to use that as an example because RF plays a big piece of the Internet of Things because most devices that we use today are connected to the IoT via wireless, you know, and it ranges from headsets to virtual reality goggles to you know, when you're driving in your car, your car's GPS and a number of things are all communicating via wireless. So the RF aspect really encompasses much of the world of IoT, but it really doesn't encompass the entire thing. Sure, that makes sense. Now, we also need to talk about wired systems here as well. What are we looking at in terms of wired systems? So wired systems complete the remainder of the world of IoT. Going back to my example, making some adjustments to my watering system at my home when I'm traveling, I start out wirelessly, but once my information is in the cell phone tower, it's going to go to the base station. And from there on end, that data is transferring wired, mostly fiber optic, cable wired through the network. It's going from wherever state I'm located at. It's traveling through the fiber optic backbone within the telecom sector, going to a data center where the application resides, which most people think about as the cloud, but it's not in the cloud. It's an actual very large physical building, or I should say lots of buildings scattered around the globe where the information's processed, then it's kicking back out. It's going back through wired, or in this case, fiber optic cable to my internet service provider for my home, which in my instance is cable, and then is going through the coaxial cable into my home, at which point it then gets into the wireless router, and then it 
leaves the world of wired and goes back into the space of RF. Really, the world of IoT is comprised of not only wireless or RF portions, there's a wired backbone behind it. Okay, now, Peter, power distribution comes into play here as well, right? It sure does, because all of this data manipulation, whether it's wired or RF, has to be handled by semiconductors and semiconductors that are geared towards churning massive amounts of data. And they require power in order to operate. We referred that as a power distribution network, and it's providing power to all of the devices. So circling back to RF components, what does Yagio offer here in particular? Well, in the world of RF, Yagio offers first, we refer to them as RF capacitors. And these are used in all of the RF front ends, whether it's in cell phones or Wi-Fi or all of the other wireless standards. And they are used to help condition the wireless signals and frequencies that are being transmitted. What's unique about these parts, today the leading edge manufacturers for the electrode system inside of them, we use copper. We use very high purity copper versus regular capacitors, which would use nickel. And the reason why copper is used is because it's drastically more conductive than nickel. You know, when we're dealing with high frequencies, you don't want to deal with losses. The amount of energy that needs to be manipulated and transferred, you don't want to be losing that energy or a portion of that energy as we go through each stage. So we need to make sure that the passive components utilized are as efficient as possible. And so therefore, the copper allows the parts to be most efficient. And at least in the capacitor industry, there's a terminology used. It's referred to as high Q, which really means they have a high quality factor or for the layperson, they're just ultra efficient in terms of the job that they're supposed to do. We also produce another material and its purpose is the exact opposite. Instead of being all about efficiency, it's actually all about loss. We want to make the performance of these parts or material to be as inefficient as possible. And we call these the flex suppressor. And they come in different forms, whether it's sheets or tape or rolls, or you can even get them as little pre-shaped objects or dimensions that are fixed to different surfaces. What's unique about this material is it's really comprised of, uh, think of a bunch of discs like plates or saucers that are all stacked up on top of each other, all horizontal, but in a very random pattern, separated by a, a non-conductive organic material. And what happens is, is that when RF energy goes into this material, it actually gets absorbed and it doesn't go through it. It just gets absorbed and it really dissipates as a minute amount of heat because of the losses introduced by each of these horizontal metallic particles or flat particles inside the material. So its purpose is all about loss, and it's used heavily in RF devices or applications really to mitigate unwanted crosstalk between RF components, both active and passive. So to build on Peter's comments, Pulse also has a wide offering of wireless antennas. And as Peter had mentioned, now with all of our devices being connected to wireless systems and all devices being considered connected devices, Pulse has a very wide offering of wireless components. Specifically, I'd like to highlight some of our embedded antenna products, which are extremely important in the IoT ecosystem. Pulse offers both a high temperature co-fired ceramics and antennas as you see them on your home network devices. So Pulse offers a high quality, high performance series of external antennas that are used for Wi-Fi 6E devices to help connect your thermostats or your connected fridge 
we also manufacture in building Wi-Fi antennas for large corporations, large businesses that allow your smart speaker in your office to be connected to your phone and to the network within your entire corporation. We also offer outdoor antennas, which in again, in the space of IoT is extremely important in the backhaul space, which allows your cell phone to communicate possibly within your home network. And that data is able to be transmitted outside of your home network to a base station where all of that data is compiled together and again, sent back out for further data processing. And the Pulse product line supports all of the new technologies and frequencies, which would include your new 5G and our frequencies, as well as Wi-Fi 60 frequencies, which I had touched on. So Ryan, what about wired components? How does the Yagio group enable the wired aspect of IoT? So Pulse has a robust offering of wired components that fit within the IoT ecosystem, specifically, again, on the wired portion for backhaul and on the fiber side, specifically being used in data centers where all of our data is being transmitted and processed and gathered, whether that's via your home network and your home entertainment or whether that's being used for business in high graphics type activities. Pulse offers signal transformers, connectors, filters, common mode chokes, and ferrite beads. And specifically, I'd like to highlight some of the Pulse components that we'll be familiar with that are very important to the IoT ecosystem, such as signal transformers and connectors. And we can think of examples within industrial IoT where factories may be demanding increased bandwidth, where they can no longer rely on field bus type protocol and are moving towards implementation of a modular Ethernet protocol. So in this case, our RJ45 connectors are being used, and we can think of this as the essential physical bridge to the internet using these Ethernet connectors. We also, again, offer our signal transformers and our integrated connector modules that are rated for 140 watts to 200 watts for power over Ethernet, which allow higher power density without saturating the magnetics. Okay, so... Peter, can you walk me through how all of the integrated circuits in these RF and wired systems are powered? Absolutely, Amelia. And this goes back to the power distribution network, or I like to call it PDN. And let's look at this from the semiconductor and walk it back to the typical backbone power for telecom and data centers now, which is 48 volts. So if we start at the processor, the first thing that as we walk away from the processor, we're going to see in the PDN output filter caps. And in the illustration here, I just show one capacitor for each power rail. But in reality, this is an array of capacitors, different technologies, different values, all to achieve a very low impedance abroad, a very broad frequency range in order to provide very, very stable power to the processor, whether it be the voltage rails for the processor core, which typically has the highest currents and biggest current swings to some of the higher voltages that are used for the I.O. So that would be the first stage at which Yagio Group components come into play in the power distribution network. The next stage is going to be output resistors. It's actually typically two resistors in series with the center tap going back to the converter that's upstream. And this is used for a feedback loop. Each power converter producing each of the voltages that are powering the semiconductor, they need a mechanism to know if they're putting out too much energy or not enough energy. And that feedback mechanism is where the voltage is trending in terms of the output. If it's too little energy, then the voltage is going to drop. And that tells the converter to kind of beef up their amount of energy transmission and lift the voltage a bit. And vice versa, if the voltage is too high, it's telling that converter to kind of ease up a bit. So this is a voltage divider. This is typically utilizing some precision thin film resistors in order to provide this feedback loop. Then we actually have another technology of resistor. It would be a current sense resistor. These are usually referred to as metal type, and they are extremely low resistance, but very precise. 
in nature. And the way the system works is you monitor the voltage coming out of the resistor. You monitor the voltage going into the resistor. There'll be a slight difference using the equation V equals IR. The controller doing the DC to DC conversion is able to calculate what the current it's delivering is and make sure it's within the expected normal range so that we know that the system is operating healthy. Then we're going to go further upstream. We go into the converter, and I've got a blow-up of a very simplified converter, which also comprises input caps, output caps, also an inductor, which is critical. And there's different technologies of these inductors that are produced by both the Kemet brand in the Yagio group, as well as the Pulse portion of the Yagio group. And really two main technologies are used for these. First being the ferrite, and there's a number of different compositions of ferrite that are used based on efficiency and target frequency of operation. And then also metal composite, which is comprised of a metallic conductive material that's encompassed in a non-conductive binder which allows for a very soft saturation, high current operating inductor. And so we see both technology used depending on what the needs of the system are. As we continue upstream, the next stage is going to be, again, capacitor technology. In my illustration, I'm calling these DC links. Reason is they're acting both ways as a decoupling cap and a filter cap. These are comprised also of different technologies, could be ceramics, could be polymer, could be aluminum, aluminum hybrid, number of different technologies, really depends on the needs of the system. Further upstream, after a, another conversion stage, most modern systems do not convert straight from 48 volts down to, say, 0.8 volts. They go to an intermediary voltage, such as 12 volts. We would have a input filtering cap, Typically, these are aluminum, aluminum hybrid, aluminum polymer. They could be tantalum polymer as well. And this is really to decouple the first stage converter from the 48-volt power rail. There's always some type of circuit protection involved, which the dominant technology used here in this technology space would be the TVS diodes. And then lastly, there would be some type of differential mode choke component. It could be an actual inductor referred to as a differential mode choke, or it could just be a fairly hefty sized surface mount inductor. There's a number of different ways of performing that function. So what does the Yagio group offer in terms of PDN components in particular? Thank you, Amelia. So we've prepared this slide to break it down by each of the brands. So if we look at Yagio, they support really three areas. They do MLCCs, all of the major dielectrics of MLCCs, whether it be C0G, X5R, X6S, X7R, be the some of the more common ones across a broad voltage and case size range. They offer the resistors and the three major type of resistors would be thick film, thin film and metal for the different you know, applications that are referred to earlier. And then they offer circuit protection. I talked about the TVS diodes, but they also offer a number of the other technologies such as gas discharge tubes and varistors and a number of other technologies under their umbrella. If we take a look at Kemet, Kemet is really focused on two areas, which would be capacitor technology and some magnetics, material science, and materials and components. In the world of capacitors, really broken down into a few different technologies. We get ceramics, which would be very similar to the dielectrics that were covered by Yagyo. We do have, uh, I guess, a larger offering in terms of high voltage than Yagyo. We also make some higher temperature components and technologies than Yagyo does. In terms of uh, polymer technology, we offer both tantalum polymer and aluminum polymer. Under the aluminum polymer category would also be 
the hybrid technology where we're combining both polymer and wet electrolyte together to get the best of both worlds. And that is really where the technology that's used, where low leakage current and higher voltages are necessary. So that kind of wraps up the capacitor technology. For the magnetic space, it's really broken down into inductors and coils, and then also the flex suppressor sheet, which I referred to earlier. In the world of pulse, as Ryan mentioned, we really got three major areas. We've got the wireless antenna components that he covered, network magnetic components, which are tied to the wired network, which he discussed. And then also, they've got a very broad range of power magnetics or inductor offerings, you know, whether it's little tiny chip inductors all the way up to some of the very large ferrite and also metal composite inductors. Okay, so with all of the advancements of IoT, what kind of constraints are being placed on these enabling components? It really boils down to two major constraints, and these are not going to go away anytime soon, if ever. That's really size and power densification. And actually, the power densification is almost an outgrowth of the size reduction that's ongoing. So if we take a look at size reduction, I think you can all remember many years ago, Motorola had what was referred to as a brick phone which was one of the first popular cell phones out there. And it was physically about the size of a brick. And that phone was able to send and receive analog cell phone calls. And it could store, I believe it was 10 phone numbers, at least early models. So it was, at the time, it was ultra leading edge, but compared to today's cell phones, it's rather archaic. Today's cell phones, I mean, they're almost like supercomputers that you can hold in your hand. And the reason why today's cell phones are able to drastically outperform models that were just offered even just a few years ago has to do with further and further integration of functionality within the semiconductors and also the passive components, which is what's driving the size reduction. So if we take a look at some of the core technologies and size reduction that Yagio is doing, let's first talk about resistors. Today, they're shipping case sizes that are smaller than what used to be the smallest case size, the 01005s. Today's latest size is the 0075, and they're working on releasing the 0050 case size. These things are so small, they're smaller than a speck of pepper. In the world of ceramics, you know, earlier we talked about the RF caps, you know, you can get those down to case size 01005. You know, I'm sure that we're not going to stop at that case size. We'll continue to work on reducing case sizes even further. And to build on Peter's point, I want to, in the terms of system size reduction, I just want to touch on some of Pulse's product offerings that I had spoke about earlier, and specifically our RJ45 type Connectors, which Pulse's RJ45 type connectors essentially offer a all-in-one type solution product. It's a solution to a discrete design and offers superior EMC as all of the magnetic portion of the product is confined within the shield of the RJ45 connector. And these RJ45 connectors are used in key applications specific to our IoT ecosystem, such as factory servers, your router that you may have at home, switches signage and video walls as we drive down the road and and all of our billboards are now becoming wireless and electronic and are no longer being pasted up. Uh, Mobile secure comms and access points, imaging, data logging, and remote monitoring. In our EP7 and EP10 products, which enable higher power density and allows for almost two times the power density in the same footprint by allowing for uniform flux distribution in a higher effective core area. Same footprint, but double the power density. I would really like to highlight our newest TLVR technology, which again, it is a new technology for Pulse. And so our TLVR technology or TLVR topology 
enables faster transient response and utilizes a dual winding power bead inductor. So in a traditional approach to meeting these types of requirements would be to employ a multi-phase buck power topology for these 12 volts or, or 48 volt type systems. Well, with our new TLVR technology, essentially all phases react in unison to the change in power that's being requested, allowing for a faster response and resulting in a lower voltage droop. And Peter, I know that you're familiar with TLVR as well. So if you have anything that you feel you would like to add in, in terms of that technology, please feel free. And Ryan, the magic behind the TLVR is that it allows customers to place these magnetics much closer to, I guess, the load, which would be typically the processor core voltage rail. And it allows basically the power delivery network system to provide power more efficiently. I mean, that's really the reason why the architecture was originally developed and is now being heavily adopted in the telecom and data center portion of IoT. Okay, so where do we go from here? What kind of advancements are you guys seeing in this realm? This is what gets me really excited because This is the aspect where we're looking forward in terms of the possibilities. I want to talk about a few areas that we're working on. The first one is related to embedded power inductors. Earlier in our discussion, we talked about the flex suppressor sheet. What we've done is we've taken that technology, we've changed up the binder system so that it is now a inorganic material set, which allows us to further densify the magnetic plates together and also make thicker systems as needed. And these can be actually embedded into the material that FR4 boards are manufactured from. By doing this, we can take the magnetic, and these can be some very high current magnetics handling 40, 50 amps, that would have been on the surface of the board and embed them inside the board. And the turns are actually produced by the traces, very heavy copper traces, and the plated through vias within the board. So that's one area that we've done some very active development on. And we're actually shipping some systems to customers with this technology today. When we look at components that are on the board, earlier we talked about both metal, composite, and ferrite. Now, in order to make systems smaller, and that's one of the things that everybody's goal is, in the world of power conversion, one of the techniques to do this is by increasing frequency. If you increase the frequency, you can shrink the size of the magnetic and you can shrink the size of the capacitors that are needed. Cost to passive component guys, they don't like this because they want to sell bigger parts and more of them. But in terms of densification and increasing functionality per unit area, increasing frequency allows you to shrink everything. One of the drawbacks is with ferrite materials, as you go up in frequency, they become less efficient. So one focus area that our MSA team in Japan has been heavily working on is to develop ferrite materials to make ferrite inductors that operate more efficiently and in particular, more efficiently at higher frequencies so that as servers and power distribution networks providing power to the processes and the servers want to bump up switching frequencies well above one megahertz, these new ferrite materials can be incorporated. Embedding is not limited to magnetics. We can also do embedding of capacitors. Now, the world has been embedding tiny ceramic capacitors for many years, but those are very small capacitor values. We've been working on embedding aluminum polymer. And what this does is, in particular, if we sandwich it between power and ground, you've got basically an infinite number of very small current loops. So you end up with a capacitor that has got a very broad frequency response, which is the ideal that designers are looking for. 
and it's distributed in the board so that it's located wherever you need electrons to power the semiconductor. Instead of having a bunch of surface mount parts distributed on the surface of the board, it's basically inside of the board. This is utilizing our aluminum polymer technology. This is something that we've been working in the lab on developing now for a number of years. And this will allow further densification or shrinkage of systems. Expanding from embedded aluminum polymer, we can package aluminum polymer in large form factors that frankly can be made into different shapes. Over here, I've got illustrated a one layer component, which is actually somewhat flexible. You can bend it without damaging the component. But we've actually had customers ask us to see if we can make capacitors that are you know, several inches in diameter, very thin with a hole in the center. So this technology affords us flexibility to provide large bulk capacitance in unique form factors. And the last uh, advanced technology, which I like to refer to, is the Connect technology, which uses TLPS, which is a transient liquid phase sintering. It's a technique for attaching different devices together. We've been shipping banks of capacitors attached together using this for a number of years into the server community supporting the cloud behind IoT. But we can also use the technology to combine different components together, whether it's capacitor banks with inductors for resonating circuits or capacitors with uh, overvoltage devices such as varistors. The sky's the limit on this. So where does this leave us? Really, when we look at IoT, it all boils down to the performance of semiconductors. The data manipulation and the movement of data from point A to point B is directly related to the high-performance semiconductors behind everything. However, when you look at these semiconductors, if you go one step further, you'll see a plethora of passive components all around them, whether they're resistors, capacitors, magnetics, interconnect. All of these passive components are really what enable these high-performance semiconductors to, frankly, do their magic. That is the world that Yajio, Kemet, and Pulse play. And with that, this really leads to an infinite number of solutions for our designers in our customer community. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Peter. Thank you for having me. It's uh, You know, I always enjoy these sessions and can't wait to meet again. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for joining me, Ryan. Thank you for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from the Yagio Group. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 